Hi, friend. Hi, friend. We are back in Boston. I have missed our studio here. You have? I, I have. I mean, it's cold as hell, and I don't enjoy that, but this feels like home. It does feel like home. I'm so happy you're here. We are coming off of two live events in, in D.C. Mm-hmm. We did a live podcast taping of Redefining Love at a Big Age, where we had a great time. You made me very uncomfortable. Um, and we talked a lot about, about relationships. And I think it's a good entree into today. Woo, yes. Um, just as an aside, I don't know why me constantly talking about anal makes you so uncomfortable. Well, I mean, we ha- I, I don't want to investigate it anymore on, uh, I mean, I need to investigate it, clearly. But it is so deeply uncomfortable for me. Wait, can I just say something? Can I just say something? Yes, go ahead, go ahead. So when I told Josh, Josh was asking about the event. Unfortunately, he couldn't come to D.C. And so he was asking about the event. And I was like, oh, we did a version of what we were supposed to do for Bow Market, yeah. but we weren't able to because you weren't here, about redefining love at a big age, which is supported by our, our downloadable ebook. And he was like, well, what did you guys talk about? And I said, we talked about different ways that we – have come to understand love and what feels like love and what is satisfying love. And Mm -hmm. he goes, without even missing a beat, did you just tell everyone that you radically decreased your standards? (laughs) (laughs) No! And I was like, well, that was, I mean, kind of. What do you mean decrease your standards? About like, Josh? Yeah, because remember during the, the episode we were talking about, like, I just don't expect him to be everything. Oh, I see, I see. Okay, 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 okay. Yes. Radically changed my expectations. Here we go. For your partner for your to partner. embrace love and harmony in your home. Right. <laughs> and so I'm embracing love and harmony because I'm not expecting him to be something he's not. Exactly. And he said, well, that's just decreasing your standards, yeah, but actually. he's fine with it. <laughs> Because he's happy. But here's where it gets to today. How could I have more than one Josh? Woo. Okay. So let's just go ahead and go there. So today is all about monogamy, non-monogamy. Ethical non-monogamy. Ethical non-monogamy. What it means to be in an open versus a polyamorous relationship. Maybe you want to swing a little bit. Who knows? It is all on the table. And what we are learning as geriatric millennials is that we got to like blow some dust off this monogamy thing, Margot. I mean, the kids are doing something new. Well, so here's the thing. Why are we so shocked? (laughs) I mean, I feel, I I really do feel like, what? (laughs) This is happening? No. (laughs) No. Listen, we were talking about it on the way to the studio today. um, That that one of the articles we read, they were quoting young people who were like 28. I said, that's not actually young. So I actually disagreed (laughs) with Tashira. I think it is young chronologically, no. I mean, maybe your brain just finished developing, you know, from a sociological standpoint. But what I'm saying is, at 30, I was a fully grown adult. Yeah, same, except we also weren't 30 or 28 post-pandemic. This is true. So I do think how the pandemic impacted our development in general... Has changed. Has changed. But um, let's just get some terms out of the way, because this was a learning opportunity for me. We all know that I like to learn. Definitions and <laughs> distinctions. Differentiate polyamory from other forms of non-monogamy like swinging and open relationships. Very important to note. Okay, so. How would you define that? What we know is that polyamory, root word, amor, love. And poly. And poly means that you love multiple people, right? So it is about the emotional and the physical or the sexual attachment. Having an open relationship means typically that you are in love with a primary partner, your person. It can be your, um, who you are in a dating relationship with. It can be who you are actually legally married to. It can be a long-term, short-term partner. And you are open to having sex or exploring things romantically with other people, but not the emotional attachment. So you don't develop a necessarily a relationship with that other person. Right. It can be more a one night stand, maybe. Right. But then would you consider having a unicorn, an open relationship, or polyamory? 
actually definitely not polyamory because you don't typically have a romantic relationship with the unicorn. It's just sexual. It's just sexual. And oh, also remember, I didn't know that. another important distinction as well is that polyamory, you're not a, a thruple. It, it's, it's not the same as being in a triad. So it is you and I are in a relationship, Margot, and then we both have separate relationships, but they are not in relationship with the other person. I need, where is my, I need my chart. Wait, yeah. wait, 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 wait. A triad is when you're in, three people are in a relationship together with each other. Exactly. An open relationship is there's someone who you are, who is your main person, your partner, your spouse, whatever, and then you have sex or other physical intimacy with other people. Exactly. Polyamory is more than a triad? Or a triad it's could not be. a triad is what I'm saying because a triad means that we are all in relationship with one another. Polyamory is not that. Polyamory means you and I are in a relationship. You have other relationships and so do I. But those people... But I think you can be in a triad and do polyamory. Oh, for sure. But I mean, that's way above my pick. That, that's yeah. above me now. Because someone who you... I mean, I'm not putting it on you, but someone who decided to follow this person from our podcast account. Okay. There's this therapist who's a therapist, like a polyamory therapist. Or like a coach. They have or, a lot of yeah. those. Because I think, to your point, it can be very confusing. And she's in a... Wait, what's the difference between a triad and a thruple? It's the same thing. Okay. She's in a triad. Okay. She's pregnant. Okay. Her wife is pregnant. Okay. By their husband. They're both pregnant at but, the same time yes. by their husband. Okay, got you. And they all date outside the marriage. Absolutely. So that is an example of both. But noted in that example, which is a great one, they are not the same thing because you can be in a thruple and not be polyamorous. You right, can be right, polyamorous. Right. But and not be in a thruple. The tentacles will never meet. Okay, so thank you. This is really helpful. And also... I kept, I keep thinking when I see her, because she's six months pregnant, I think she goes by she. I, I keep, when, when, when I see this person who's six months pregnant and her wife is five and a half months pregnant or five months pregnant. They're basically about to have twins. They're going to have twins. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you have no idea what's coming. <laughs> I mean, like, and I'm so intrigued because if, if she can date, if she can have two spouses and twins, and date outside the relationship, and have a job. Michael said, my God, there's a lot of relationships. It's like, <laughs> bitch, when do you sleep? When do you sleep? When do you eat? When do you read? When, when do, do you, you go shit? to the bathroom? But like, keep going, because I have a lot of questions. It is so interesting to me, because it is just not part of my experience. So let's talk about the experience, because as we were kind of thinking about ideate is my new word. As we were ideating about this episode, I thought to myself, we have to, for everyone who is listening and they're like, what the hell? Ain't no way I would never. We have to contextualize monogamy in this conversation totally. first. We have to contextualize all social constructions. Absolutely. And we know that monogamy is a social construct. And if we look back in time, as far as the human species is concerned, since it has been in existence Monogamy is actually a very short period of our existence. And fairly new. And fairly new. And so what many folks have come to understand, especially those who research the idea of relationships and how humans pair or not, is that monogamy has been forced upon us in the same kind of heteronormative constructs that, that exist currently. And that what folks have done is start to kind of separate themselves from the matrix to say, is this what I really want? And I think what oftentimes I've had conversations with people about who may be a little bit older is, well, aren't you just describing dating? Like, aren't you just describing dating multiple people? Why does it have to have a name, a name attached to it? Uh, I don't know why. Well, I, I was general, genuinely asking. <laughs> I think, um, <laughs> I, Why I would you ask me? <laughs> well, I think a couple of things. Number one, when we say ethical non-monogamy, that takes a lot of kind of the sleaziness okay, and so, dishonesty out of dating that exists sometimes. So I am intrigued by this concept of ethical non-monogamy because not for me, but just in general, like how do you hold people in the light and respect them and their bodily autonomy and their boundaries and their and their needs? And also date other people. And so I wonder if there's more 
openness about what people are doing as opposed to doing it on the DL. Yes, and that is And that what... seems this to the to your point about sleazy. Yeah, exactly. And so no one is running game. I mean, obviously there are likely ways to be dishonest. I'm not at all alleging that because I also want to go on record to say that while for me these concepts have been very intriguing, I have decided they are not for me for reasons that I'm sure we'll get into in this episode, but uh, not for me either. Any- <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Marco? <laughs> I, I mean, I'm intrigued from a distance. Yeah. Like not even that intrigued. But I'm I mean yes, I'm I'm, so. in, I'm in I'm intrigued because this is taking it has a cultural it there is a moment. It, it is it a is moment. A moment and our, I don't want to minimize that. And our language is changing. And for me, as part of the queer community, girl, when I was coming out of my long-term relationship, dipping my toe into the dating pool, everybody was talking about how they were not they were not monogamous, they weren't this, they weren't that, to the point where I had to tell people I see you. I think that is great for you and maybe even good for me because it might diminish the chances of you you hauling. However, I, I am for monogamous. The, the straight, the cis hetero people, oh, people don't know what you haul. U-hauling unless means? you went to Wellesley Smith or Barnard or one of those schools <laughs> like I did, but um it is the joke is what does a lesbian bring to the second date a u-haul ha 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 that you know very quickly you find yourself in a serious partnership even a living girlfriend after the first date they move quickly and so I thought to myself well if this person is poly and they have a main partner then maybe we can actually date and do what I'm seeking which is to not have strings attached but what I recognize is that it was just not for me and it started to get very murky very very quickly friend what I wanted to say because I don't want to say like, oh my gosh, this is all the rage now. Like it, it's new to 2024 because it's not new. Mm-mm. It's just, and I don't like that when like the Housewives of Brooklyn start doing it, then it becomes all the rage. Wait, who are the Housewives of Brooklyn, friend? Well, there's just like, like women in Brooklyn, <laughs> you know. <laughs> You know, I like, was like, Rocco got a new series. No, 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 no. <laughs> like when people in the playground in, in oh no, I in, see, I see. In, in what's it called, Heights, Brooklyn Heights, or cute neighborhoods in Brooklyn. Yeah. It when the New York Times starts writing about it, <laughs> more people know. Yeah. But it's not that this is new. It is absolutely. And so I don't want to new. offend or upset people who have been engaged in this life for a long time. Like there are people who've been committed to this for a very long time. Yeah. And it is now being adopted by more cis heteronormative people, which is also problematic, I imagine. And so let me just say this. So I want to go back to the queer part because, yes, for people who have been marginalized for a very long time and who live lives that are outside of heteronormative constructs and values, this is especially not anything new. We also talked about people who sit in academic institutions who are constantly challenging certain norms around gender, around feminism, the patriarchy. Not anything new, because I think it is it is a very enticing concept when you break down all of the harms that are often underneath the idea of getting married for the purposes of wealth, accumulation, property ownership, the idea of it being a a contract and status. For a long time, there were people who could not even get married because they didn't have enough property to do so, right? And so we're They talk- weren't desirable in that way. And they were not desirable in that way. And so marriage as a Western construct does have some pretty shady, if not problematic roots. Now, it has evolved for many people, but especially if you were in a hetero situation, there are some gender imbalances that I think we could agree take place. And so from that perspective, I think the push towards ethical non-monogamy has tried to overturn some of those things. Mm -hmm. But I'm here to tell you as someone who knows quite a few people who are in open relationships or who are polyamorous, who are even in throuples, that the shit don't get easier. I was going to say, it just seems more and more complicated, particularly if you have feelings for people. I think that um, this is what someone described described to me, and we were filming this at the time of Ramadan. So shout out to all of our Muslims uh, watchers and listeners, and maybe you get closer to Allah during this time. But they described to me that if you are fasting, for example, and you are in a majority Muslim country, 
it is so much easier mm-hmm. because things shut down at a certain time. Everyone is breaking fast together. Everything is much slower paced. You're not on calls and running around because you are fasting. So the entire society shifts towards this. This society is not shifting towards non-monogamy anytime soon. And so just whose name you put down on the form when you go to the hospital, mm-hmm. how you register your child for, for school, all of these things are designed in a very heteronormative way. And we have been indoctrinated to think of ourselves as one person, one partner. And so the jealousy and the ownership that we think we have over the other person, the Disney fairy tales we've watched our entire lives, I think get in the way. I 100% agree. But I have a question because we're filming in a time of deep technological historical change, right? True. Right, in terms of what we have access to, the information that we have, and what's going on. What I actually don't understand is how do people have the time? I am a very practical person. Yeah. And so to all of your points about the cis-heteronormative assumptions of of lifestyle and administrative tasks and accumulation of wealth and blah all of that i i'm i'm 100 percent with you and it has geared 100 percent historically towards men as the head of the household and women sure. as subservient now For that sure. has slightly changed in certain parts of the country over time yeah particularly with the legalization of gay marriage For sure but still within the constructs of two people and two people and one person being the primary person, right? Sure. And there's a lot of critique in academic cir- circles and outside of how gay marriage has adopted cis heteronormative values mm-hmm. around marriage, right? So we could we could do a whole episode on that. But what I don't understand is if you're a full blown adult in a partnership, yeah. surviving in this modern world, yes, and maybe you have a child or two or three, right? Because you wanted to have children. How do you have time to have multiple partners? I don't understand. Some days, and I am not even as busy as most people, I don't have time to brush my teeth. And I'm not even joking, right? So is it like you schedule it like you schedule a workout? Yeah. Even if you can just like slip someone in with a calendar invite. (laughs) Relationships are things that you need to water and feed and nourish. Okay, so I have a couple things to say about this. I completely agree. Some days I don't want someone to look at me, let alone talk to me, and surely do not touch me. And the older I get and the more fulfillment I I find outside of a partnership, it is more days than I would have thought when I was a much younger person. Completely get you. But for this conversation, let me argue the alternative, okay? I'm not arguing. I'm just inquiring. Yeah, when I say argue, I mean just say the position. Okay, say the position. Well, folks who what, are... <laughs> what normies are we? Let me count. Wait, which normie are we? Uh, what folks who are in ethical non-monogamous relationships would say is that for those of us who are normies and in monogamous relationships... We expect too much of our partners. Ah. Mm -hmm. And so your partner cannot be your therapist, your doctor, your lawyer, your lover, your best friend, your confidant, that there needs to be some distinction. And this idea that one person can be all of those things was flawed from the beginning. Mm. And there are actually historical origins that we can trace back and pinpoint to the time that that occurred. The rise of the nuclear family. For example, we have been a communal species since the beginning of time, culturally, especially more so for people of certain um, geographies. And so they're just saying, let me kind of, you know, a la carte this thing. This bay over here is the lover. This bay over here is the person that I go to, to to twist my hair and rub my head and tell all of my deep secrets to. This bay over here is the one that gives me career advice. My you know? mind is blown. I like I, I I literally feel like my grandma used to feel when I would <laughs> would access her email. <laughs> right? Like No, I do. She's like an attachment. She'd be like, "Can you email my girlfriends and tell them?" <laughs> literally, I would go over and do all her emails. But th- that's how I feel right now. Like you you're doing this for me. 
Well, uh, okay, can I just say something? Yes, Because yes. we're making the assumption, I think, but maybe not, that all of this is ethical. Because we keep saying ethical non-monogamy. Yes, please go there, friend. And I just, my practice and teacher professor hat goes on right away. And I'm like, well, why are we assuming all of this is ethical? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. And yeah. who's making the choices? And are people feeling coerced into doing this because they want to keep their partner satisfied? That's the part. Right. So that is the part. Right, so, so like if you're in a monogamous marriage or relationship partnership, that has extended over a period of time and one partner is unhappy and they say, for me to continue in this relationship, I want to open up the marriage. Yep. And then this person agrees. Yep. So there, there's a version where they're like, oh, that sounds cool. I'm in. But there's also a version where it's like, I don't want to do this, but I don't want to get divorced. I don't want to lose Or I don't want to lose this my person. Partner. And so, and I, I think that that is... Very murky territory to be in, Margot, especially when you start the relationship off monogamous. Yeah. I think that there can be a very insidious or, or overt power imbalance that occurs by the moving party, the person who's actually coming to the relationship saying, I actually, bitch. What I actually need is... What I need is some okuder. You, you know, that becomes... <laughs> what I actually need is someone else to rub my back. Yeah, yeah. So that that becomes difficult um, to to decide: Am I making this decision because I truly want to and I agree, or because I'm trying to save my relationship and I don't know what else to do? And this is really important to my partner. So then you have to question the ethics. But I, I think when people use that term, what they're saying is a couple things. Number one, every everything should be above board. So transparent. Transparency. So I don't go out go out into the world and date without um and they have different terms for this that I'm not as well versed in. I encourage folks to go and do a deeper dive dive if you're interested. But I don't go out in the world and date without my primary partner knowing or without the person I'm dating knowing. And people sit down and actually draw up rules and contracts around this. And yeah. so it may be that you can't date any of my friends or it may be that you can't bring them to our house or it may be that I need to know or I don't want to know. That for me is what I understand the ethical part of it all to be. Really rooted in transparency and how the primary couple in the case of polyamory here, not open rela relationships, not throuples or anything else how the primary couple have decided to define their non-monogamy. Mm -hmm. Because you can cheat in a polyamorous relationship. When you violate the family contract. Absolutely. Got it. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. To, to, to my earlier statement, I, 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 my mind is blown a little bit. I, but cool. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm down. <laughs> but here's where we were talking too right so there's a version of society that has adopted these kind of unspoken or spoken rules and regulations okay. around normativity right For the sure. normies right so that marriage is the goal that home ownership is the goal that children are the goal that professional advancement is the goal right all of these things that we're trying to unpack a little bit in this podcast right and some have nefarious origins and others don't i think the idea of marriage and marriage in isolation as we have it in this country is not working for sure so i think we we agree on that yeah but but where this whole i don't want to call it a movement like where lifestyle yeah um could become very murky is particularly as it relates to consent mm. Mm -hmm. Right. And so there's been a lot written around kind of sexual exploration and consent and BDSM. I, I am not part of this community. Um, you don't it, say. <laughs> so shocked. So wild. <laughs> um, but but how do we ensure people are safer? So a couple things. I, I think that um, actually one of the articles that we talked about, someone who was, I think in a polyamorous relationship said, and she's quoted by the Times as saying, she said, I told someone recently that I had two boyfriends and their response to me was, ew, I don't want to hear about your sex life. 
And she said, I wasn't telling you about my sex life. I was telling you about my partners. And so I do think mm. we have to distinguish for our audience. There is a difference between what we're talking about right now and any type of like kink or sexual play. Because you could be in a polyamorous relationship that's sex the sexless. Oh, you can also I also read that you can be a you can have an asexual life partner. Oh, absolutely. That's not just a friend. I, I don't really understand. Like you don't have sex with this person, but you have an intimacy that's not just but it could be like romantic without sex yeah i mean there are a lot of people who who are asexual and if they pair with someone else who is asexual or who does not mind their their asexuality then yeah Mm -hmm. i can definitely see that and the same thing here right there is oftentimes these things are lumped together because i and i just really wish i had my venn diagram because there are let me get you one So our sponsor today is one of our favorite companies of all time. No, no, no. Favorite is an understatement, okay? I I love all the companies that align themselves with the podcast because we are a mission-driven platform, and so we're intentional about that. But cloth and paper, I am a stand, Margot. Same, same, same. And when we went to the planner conference in November, cloth and paper, Ashley was a celebrity. Yeah. She had cups. (laughs) <laughs> that had the cloth and paper. Uh, she had a coffee hour. Yeah. That we missed. Yeah, unfortunately. But we got a cup of coffee that had their name on it with the font yep. and the black and white with the napkin and the. Our room keys were branded cloth and paper. Yes, I forgot about that. I mean, at the Lowe's. So yes. they had to. I mean, she is so brilliant. Young black woman doing her thing, created this company. We are so impressed and so happy. To partner with her. And both of us have have been shoppers for many years. Yeah, I mean, if I, we talk about cults a lot. And, and I'm anti-cult. But this is a cult that I'm just saying I might join. So, struggling to steer your 2024 goals in the right direction? Cloth and Paper has everything you need to restart your resolutions and make your desk super luxe in the process. Since their inception in 2015... They've been at the forefront of minimalist stationary design, earning acclaim for their quality and innovation. From leather planners to chic inserts, desk accessories, and more, they've got everything to suit your needs. Discover their curated selection at clothandpaper.com and apply code JUSTICE to receive a 15% discount on your initial purchase and see why the planners and doers can't live without cloth and paper. Thank you, Cloth and Paper, for sponsoring this episode. And you all, make sure you grab some of their amazing stationery. I love their inserts for my planner. Also, they have great notepads, pens, all the things, girl. You're going to love them. I also would just like to highlight their monthly subscription. Tashira gets their monthly subscription. I do it in three-month increments when I'm feeling like I want to splurge yeah. but i've also gifted the three month subscription to various friends and it is su- such a great gift so you can apply the justice code to to a subscription as well if it's your first time we're back we got to share some paper professor how you're checking um, in i just want to be clear that i don't i don't want to 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 say that bdsm is the same thing as polyamory exactly right i think i am learning too um and one is kink yes and one is who you love yes and 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 so but i love that you brought that up Margot, because going back to my previous example i think people who have not dove into this community oftentimes get the sex and the relationships confused for obvious reasons but also i would argue taking uh my venn diagram here that There is a broader set of values that I think both of these communities likely hold, which makes them intersect at some point. Right. So I think this is what I was talking about. Yeah. What is in the middle? So we have our ethical non-monogamy here and our kink community here. And then everybody just kind of is here playing around and having a good time. But these can be separate and distinct for sure. Right. So you could be in an ethical non-monogamous relationship and not at all interested in any form of kink. None. You can be in a like forty year marriage, mm-hmm. monogamous marriage, and yep. be really into kids. And I mean, have a good time. Yeah, for sure. Yes, yes. I got it. Yes, yes, for sure. But I, but I want to go back to 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 the time conversation because you're right. I am tired just thinking about it. And you made a point about 
what happens when folks have children? Well, so I was, I mean, I have no idea. <laughs> I, I literally, I, I sometimes literally can barely put my children to bed and put myself to bed and, yeah. and to have dinner. I mean, like, and I know I'm not alone there, so I cannot imagine. But the more I thought about it, I was like, oh, I, so two things. One, I think this becomes more prevalent when parents emerge from the small children bubble. That makes sense. So they have older children. They maybe have school-age children. They have teenage children, right? Like the children aren't around as much. So that's one. Maybe they're divorced. Maybe they're separated or they don't have a consistent partner. So maybe the children aren't at their home all the time. Yeah. That's one. But what I actually, as I was kind of thinking about, like how did, would this actually work with a family with small children? And I wonder if having an open relationship ah. is more accessible for two reasons. One, because it's an escape from your life. I can see that. Right. And like a lot of people are are feeling trapped if they have small children, not all obviously, and that an open relationship without any romantic expectations could be seen as an escape or a temporary escape without the obligation of maintaining a relationship. Mm -hmm. I do not know how you would maintain multiple romantic relationships and have small children, but I'm sure it's done. Yeah. I mean, I, I would love to um, hear from people who maybe are in open relationships or who are polyamorous to talk about when we enter children into the mix, what that looks like. I, I would argue probably maybe a bit more like a throuple because then you think about it, it feels like community parenting and that responsibility mm -hmm. is shared um, more so than a polyamorous situation where you're kind of rotating people in and out. Yeah, I can, I can see, I can see that. I, I also just, I, I know more people who are in open relationships okay. than who are in polyamorous relationships. Um, and so I wonder if other people's experiences are similar or not. Can I say something about that? And I think we've touched on this before. I think seeing more people in open relationships at this season has something to do with the phase of life we're in. And if you kind of have followed a more traditional path, especially a heteronormative path, gotten married, had children kind of throughout your 30s, parenting, and you're in your early 40s, and you're looking at your partner like, this can't be all life has to give. I love you. I enjoy sharing life with you. But it feels like something is missing. I think for those couples, opening things up might seem like the easiest and the safest thing to do. I also think that opening up a marriage might now be what 20 years ago was cheating. Girl, so this is, right? I, so much of this, I have thought about my father this entire episode and his father, who has so many children, Marco, he cannot count them all. It, I mean, it is sick. And he will tell you that as if it's a badge of honor. My dad's dad. And my dad is 59 years old, has been married once. And has not been in a long-term committed relationship really since. Or ever. Or ever, I would argue. And so some of this language, if he had it to apply to his life and he understood himself in this way earlier on, probably could have saved the women in his life. A lot of pain. A lot of fucking pain. And he would have had more context to understand himself as something other than a fucking playboy, right? And the maturation that can and should go into human development and that you don't have to just trick off on a bunch of women to feel good about yourself. No, I am someone who participates in ethical non-monogamy and this is what it looks like for me. So yes, some of this is about us giving ourselves language to describe our wants and our needs so that everyone can operate with consent, I think. Right. So I think there's that, but then there's also the just playing devil's advocate, right? Is it just a cover for people to go off and cheat on their partners? I mean, hey, hey, hey. Come on. Right. So this is this is where I really question who's taking advantage of this ethical non-monogamy, particularly in cis hetero marriages or long-term partnerships. Amen. Because of all of the responsibilities associated with surviving in this modern world. And especially when you do have young children, who oftentimes is who's taking, taking on... Who's taking care of them? So it's not that... So I would hypothesize that more in cis hetero long-term relationships with small children, more men are taking advantage of ethical non-monogamy 
as it relates to open relationships. Mm -hmm. I don't have data to back this up. So if I'm wrong, please correct me. Yeah. But there is no, that that's not necessarily an issue if that is okay with the other partner. But how do we ensure that it's okay with the other partner? And see, and that's the thing, because I've actually known a couple where the spouse was a serial cheater and the, the spouse was a man or is a man. And the wife was like, do you want an open relationship? Do you want a polyamorous relationship? Let's discuss that. And he was adamant that he did not want it. Well, that's ridiculous. <laughs> that is like so absurd. It he doesn't so have that choice. He's already fucked over his wife eight million times a Saturday. <laughs> that's what I'm saying to Absolutely. Shara. I know, I know, I know, I know. Yes, so, yes. Okay, so this is an interesting component of it. I really like that 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 the young people are teaching us how to be more aware yes i i, I love this for y'all again everything go ain't for everybody crazy go off sis like seriously if you're feeling confident oh wait i i missed a point that go, i wanted go, go, to go, go, say go. people stis how do you ensure that your partners are practicing safer sex. Amen. My God, it is not safe out there. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and that would really freak me out. I mean, I, that's probably of no surprise to anyone who's watched or listened to this <laughs> podcast. But I just, I also just mean it like that one of the articles that we read talked about creating community guidelines, which I think is great, particularly in the context of sex clubs. And, mm -hmm. and that they had to specify no sheathing. Do you know what sheathing is? Taking off the condom. Why would anyone sheath in an environment like that? Like that, that. yeah. That's yeah. so, so, so abusive. Yeah. yeah. And then one of my former students told me, this is not related to ethical non-monogamy, polyamory, or any sort of lifestyle. This is just like online dating. She told me that, she thing is something that happens a lot. Yeah. That, I mean, if, if people are even having safer sex, I mean, I think that's the first assumption. And I would argue that that does not happen nearly as much as we would like to think. I think people are having consensual engagements just without condoms, period. Not even a thought of it. And, and that is in relationships that are monogamous and the one spouse is cheating. I mean, we know this just by the STI data whether folks are monogamous or or not, unfortunately. So it is it is a scary time and we want folks to protect themselves and to make sure that you are doing this all with consent and that you have control of your body. Because I think to myself, if I was younger and, and folks were having this conversation, where would I stand? I think I definitely would have given some part of this a try. I'm not exactly sure what. Um, open relationships, I mean, check. I think that would have made perfect sense for me. Polyamory, maybe. Um, a throuple, hell no, because I need to be the star. I'm not, I can't, I can't. Um, so there's some dynamic. No, but there's, but there's something there. There's something there about knowing yourself. Yeah. Like, we've said this a lot. Like, not everything is for everyone. Mm -mm. And this just might not be for us. It, but, yes. But it is for some celebrities. So I would just like to bring it to our attention because lots of celebrities have spoken openly about, yeah. about polyamory. Some folks that I didn't even know. Right. So we know about Jada and Will. I mean, we all know that. Dolly Parton. Dolly. And it makes sense why Dolly Parton was on that stage with that day of Dallas Cowgirls with that uh, cheerleading outfit on. I say Dolly's out here living her best life still. Yeah. But unclear if she has romantic relationships with other people. Well, it says that Dolly Parton is in an open relationship. But clarified that it focuses on trust and understanding rather than seeking ah, outside partners. But I have no idea what that, what that means. means. I feel like if, if that's the definition of open relationship, we're in open relationships. <laughs> Well, what I was going to say was she Trust strikes me as a woman who is 80 or close to it, who is just so confident. It's like, yeah, I mean, he's around. He sleeps in the bed with me or not. He has a different house. We see each other sometimes. It's just me recording my music, having a good time. RuPaul. Now, RuPaul, I had no idea I about. had no idea either. I had no idea. I thought he was a married man. And he is a married man, but like... He's like a monogamous yeah so what he says is there's no such thing as monogamy with men 
What do you think about that? Ooh, girl, this is a whole separate episode, mm. honestly. Um, I think there are certain uh, expectations around, and, and fluidity among queer men versus women, for sure. I, I agree with that. Um, fascinating. I'm sure there are a lot more. Yeah, yeah. Can I just make one last point before we wrap this section up and then we are going to hop into dumb shit in just one second, y'all? Is that when you talk about, like, knowing ourselves... The reason I think I can say that I would have tried this all out when I was younger is because it would have been just that, an, an exercise, and exploration. I think at this age, what I know about myself through going through a lot of fucking therapy is that um, feeling safe and feeling secure are the two highest tenets for me in a relationship, whether it is romantic, familial, or in a friendship. And I think that would be very difficult for me if I began to introduce new people into or different people into the dynamic. I, I think that's so wise. I think for me, and I was thinking about this too, it would have had, I would have to reprogram my brain. Yes. Because I, my, I grew up or I matured in a time where the highest emotional value and in societal value was placed on partnership in a particular that's, way. That's such a good point. And so I think it is very intriguing to me. It makes sense, right? There are a lot of people I love. There are a lot of people I could love. Feeling safe in your body and safe in the world and safe in your own ideas of pleasure and worth seems incredibly appealing. But I would have to have grown in a different time. Absolutely. Yeah. There is so much to unpack, I'm not interested in spending my time at a big age questioning all of those parts of my identity. I'm and good. also, I, I don't think actually we have to, right? I think we know why our brain is a certain way. That's fair. And that to feel safe, you need X, Y, and Z. For me to feel safe, I need something else, but very similar, honestly. Um, and I don't, I also know myself, I wouldn't have the energy because I am such an emotional person. I, I really capture the energy of people around me so if people are sad or frustrated That's or jealous true. or happy or despondent i absorb all that i can barely do that in my life i can't imagine i would have to literally be a different person yeah and i don't want to be a different person and also margo let's be honest you nap <laughs> you go to bed early I mean, I, but, but that's my highest form of pleasure yeah no i, I was just saying, saying like, like getting a green recovery on my whoop you don't have time for this. You are trying to get to a deep REM sleep by 8.30. <laughs> Bitch, you ain't got time to be talking about you going out to the institution with X, Y, and Z. Also, I don't like crowds. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. <laughs> Not your relationship is a crowd. <laughs> no, I just mean like... I just like... I... I I value space. Yes. My so, space. Your space. That be so. it emotional or physical. Amen. Look, I am all for this life, but not for me. That is fair. And also, I think we can talk about it in a way, just as we've incorporated other things that weren't kind of prevalent in our language when we were younger, as just accepted parts of our community there are, i have lots of friends who are in open marriages that doesn't that doesn't intimidate me i think the goal is and we hope we are adding to this discourse is to destigmatize destigmatize exactly yeah. and also not other people who are not like if it's not for you you're not it's not that you're not cool a girl yeah yeah, this right? is not like, an after-school special. To, right, you don't have to like feel like a square because yeah. you're not at the sex yeah. club. Yeah, want some ethical non-monogamy? How about it? Oh, you're just not cool enough to be polyamorous. Why, why are you saying it like that? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that was my after-school <laughs> special. That was my dare keep kids off drugs voice, But bitch. I guess I just mean like sometimes these things like lots of I don't want to say it's a trend because that minimizes it, but things that people are becoming more aware of. Yes. Then in turn make people feel badly. And that's not our goal. No. And let me just say that I was feeling, I don't want to say a slight pressure, but I was almost feeling that as I was I dating again, right? And I had to just tell somebody, I had I had to read them, not like read, but read 
Like, I, every resource that you can name to me, I already know the thesis statement of. I am aware. Just because I am not part of it and I disagree does not mean I don't understand it. It's not for me and that's right, but okay. but I think that it can be weaponized this way. Yeah. Right, like, you're not, the wellness community can do the same thing. Like, you're not at your, you must not be like, at your highest level of self-knowledge. Because if you were, then, then you, you would. would be engaged in... X, Y, and Z. I think all of that's bullshit. I'm and, just I, and I argue the alternative. Because I am at a higher level of self-awareness than I've ever been in my life is why I am not engaged in it. And some of y'all holds a lot safer for it, okay? Because God ain't done with me yet. And I can't imagine the way I would have to pull up on somebody for something that is unethical in an ethical monog non-monogamous situation. No, thank you. I got to stay out of jail. My bail money is going towards the Birkin, Margo. But not the litigation. <laughs> All right. Okay, more to come. I think we just scratched the surface on this because Girl. there's so much else that I want to unpack here. Yeah. Like, how do we talk to young people about this? Oh, this is a good one. Right? Because this is something that I imagine as young people are starting to date and engage with other people in an intimate way, it's going to be more prevalent in high school that is I, such a good point yeah everything and is going to look sorry, were you the person who told me that 30 percent of gen z women identify as queer Ooh, i wasn't but i can definitely believe it right so again polyamory non-ethical non-monogamy kink right is not exclusive to the queer community but like how these overlap with people's expanding Id identities yeah for sure. It's also interesting, especially as we have a greater way to express ourselves and mm. language to define things. So you all sound off, please. We would love to hear your hot takes on this. We know that many of you are in relationships that are designed in the way similar to what we have discussed today. Um, remember that the comment section for us is a safe space, mm -hmm. but we would love to hear from you. Absolutely. Let's move on. So in today's dumb shit segment, um, former President Trump, in response to Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer criticizing Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's ceaseless attack on Gaza, where over 30,000 people have died, said, and this is the quote from President Trump. Okay. Any Jewish person that votes for Democrats hates their religion. They hate everything about Israel and they should be ashamed of themselves because Israel will be destroyed. Okay, let me just say the first thing I thought when I read this, Margo, is what you have said privately to me, because we have these conversations quite often about the way in which the right is using this as an opportunity to tear apart the left. And unfortunately, we are, too many of us are pandering straight into their hands. And it is a perilous time, indeed, obviously, for folks in Gaza, the many lives, as you pointed out, that have been lost. Today, they are on the brink of a famine. Obviously, we know that all of the hostages have not been returned as a result of the October 7th attack um, that Hamas led against Israel. So we understand that it is a very, very perilous time, indeed. But what I think scares me even more than war is the idea that here in this country, we see the ways in which our political parties are being even more polarized. And I don't know how we get back to a place where we can even have a conversation, to be quite honest. It scares me. And I'm not usually a fatalistic person, mm -mm, but I, I'm at the point now where I feel a little hopeless, friend. Mm -hmm. I do too. I also feel like how, I mean, how dare Donald Trump question someone's identity when he has no idea what he's talking about? None. Right. So to question someone's identity, someone's ethnicity, someone's religion, someone's family history without any context and to, to fear monger in this way. That's exactly what it is. Is so pathological. And that people believe him is even worse. So I think it is, there are so many levels of hysteria and troubling aspects of this. I'm almost at a loss for words. Yeah. I also think 
to your point, it's it plays right into this playbook where the left is getting so fucking played. I mean, played in the biggest way imaginable. Like, kid and play house party played. It is so obvious the intentions here a hundred percent i listened to this great episode of the daily it's one of my favorite podcasts y'all same where they were um actually digging into um was it the episode on schumer you listen to this yes Yes. and the way in which netanyahu has been getting more and more extreme and more and more to the right because of these corruption charges and so he's courting it's he is donald trump so it's no surprise that Donald Trump is riding for his political stance in Israel. Um, and uh, what I fear is, um, as it relates to this country in a young Gen Z, Gen A TikTok generation, the idea of what it means to see Israel as an ally will erode if this moment in history is not corrected, in my opinion. For your children's, generation and their socio-political analysis, we may not think that far ahead, but these moments create the narratives that they are going to understand about this country and this world okay. in 15, 20 years. It's so deeply troubling. And another example of how this war has been politicized in a way that has nothing to do nothing. to the victims of Gaza, to the victims who are hostages. And to the Israeli to, to the Israeli people who don't support Netanyahu, yeah, yeah, right, which are many. I mean, I think your analogy to him as Donald Trump is like really important, and also important to know that he was not, from my understanding, always that way. I mean, no. this is someone who's been in politics for a very long he, time. He grew up. I mean, my understanding um, is that he has been he is part of a political family. He has grown up and come of age as a politician. He was always to the right, but yeah. never like this. And the corruption charges and, and movement into Gaza um, and his response to the October 7th attacks have been a magnification of his, of his evolving po- politics. Um, I don't want to dig deep into Netanyahu. We have not had a full episode about this intentionally because we believe that this is a very nuanced issue that in many ways... We don't have the best language we think to be able to discuss, and our positions have evolved in many ways. And so I don't want to dig deep into him. This is about Trump. But what what are you thinking, friend? I, I think that I think that was succinct. I mm-hmm. think that w- what Trump d- what Trump does is is pin people against each other. What Trump can should not do or will not do to me is make me question my identity. And the fact that we allow him to do that really, really is so troubling. I I just want to be a fly on the wall in so many rooms right now. Last thing I'll say is, if you think for one second that Donald Trump cares about Jewish people or Jewish causes, I think we would be mistaken. I mean, you talking about him being anti-Semitic is a cue to that point. And what scares me is that for nothing but political gain, the right is aligning themselves with a culture and a people who we already know based upon certain policies and certain rhetoric. It's just not the fucking truth. And it is only for this moment to capitalize, like you said, on the divisiveness that is occurring in this country, if not to create even more of it. Mm -hmm. absolutely all right stay tuned you all for more episodes on what is happening in politics especially as we race towards the election thanks for listening to justice we hope you enjoyed this episode if you'd like to learn more about our podcast be sure to check us out on our website at justicepodcast.com you can also reach out to us there if you want to be featured on the show or if you have a business or a product that you think would be a good fit for our audience thanks again for listening